All right, so chest trauma, normal standards, blah, 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 introduction, uh, really poorly moulaged patient, uh, you know, although he does have that uh, ghosty eye or whatever they call that, um, smoky eyes. Yeah, he's got that smoky eyes going on well there, doesn't he? So. <laughs> so, uh, like they say, you can make a um, statistic for anything you want. You can make the numbers say anything you want. Um, but one in four trauma deaths are due to thoracic injuries. Uh, one in one trauma deaths are due to the heart stopping. Um, thoracic injuries are are fairly high on the trauma list because they, you know, the vital organs that are in there. So let's talk a little about our anatomy. Remember, we have 12 sets of ribs, 12 pairs. Um, what's the difference between true ribs and false ribs? Remember that term? Go ahead, stay, Casey. False ribs aren't connected. False ribs are not connected to the sternum. So the true ribs are all connected to the sternum, but the cartilage of the false ribs are connected to the cartilage of another rib. So um, which ribs are the false ribs? Does anybody know? Last, last ones? No. So the false ribs are ribs number nine and 10 because their cartilage wraps around and connects to the cartilage on rib number eight. The floating ribs, which is ribs 11 and 12, they're not considered false ribs or true ribs. They're considered floating ribs. They're the one, they're, they're another category of rib. They are the ones that more or less protect our kidneys and that's their big, their big function. But because they're floating, their other, you know, their anterior end is not connected to anything. They are uh, at risk of puncturing kidneys and uh, solid organs and stuff if they're pushed too hard. But particularly abdominal organs, you know, the root, spleen, kidneys, or liver. Um, they don't normally cause a lot of problems for your um, thoracic cavity. Notice the diaphragm. The diaphragm connects to the spine right at the base of T12, um, right uh, where your floating ribs are, but then arches all the way up to the front of the abdomen where the uh, close to where the xiphoid, just below the xiphoid process, but extends up inside the thorax. So that's why your liver is protected heavily by your rib cage because your liver is up underneath your um, diaphragm and up inside your rib cage. Same with your spleen and your stomach. And this is why you will often hear abdominal um, sounds, you know, GI sounds, bowel sounds, when you're listening to the lower regions of the lungs. That doesn't necessarily mean they have a ruptured diaphragm or a bowels in their chest, but um, yeah. So uh, you have the large scapulas in the back, you have the clavicle, um, the manubrium is the top part of the sternum. So you have the body of the sternum with the manubrium on top, the xiphoid process on the bottom, and then the sternal notch. Those are all terms that you're gonna need to remember. Inside your thorax, see that picture doesn't show it. You can kind of see it in this picture, but it's important to remember that your thorax is actually divided into three different chambers or three different areas or spaces. And you have the two plural spaces, one for each lung, and then you have the mediastinal space, which is in the center, which houses the heart, the thymus, the part of the trachea, your aorta, your vena cava, and your esophagus. Um, those are the primary lung organs that are in the mediastinal space. And it's its own little cavity uh, between the lungs, and you can get air in there if the trachea rips uh, your main bronchi, one of your main bronchi's uh, damage or something like that. But then the bronchi extend out of the mediastinum into the plural, the left and right pleural spaces where your left and right lung are. So your lung is in a separate container or a separate pouch from the heart. There, There is differentiation there. Um, 
So, um, all right. So here are the various muscles that you're going to find above, uh, around the ab, um, the thorax, not the abdomen. We're doing chest trauma today. Um, Notice the pectoralis minor lays underneath the pectoralis major. So you have different layers of muscle there. Uh, same within the back, you have a lot of different layers of muscle. Um, and so you can see how listening to lung sounds can be challenging with the larger patients or patients who have larger muscle mass. Um, but with all those muscles, this is also why weird little movements or pulls, especially as we're getting older, tend to cause a lot of injury or you know pain in your back or something because you can pull a muscle or cramp something pretty easily and like, how? Well, there's lots of different muscles in there that run in different directions. Um, all right, so what's the point of our rib cage? Well, or our thorax. The primary is breathing. So the thorax creates a semi, and the rib cage creates a semi-rigid structure in that will not collapse when you take a deep breath. So when the diaphragm contracts down, and I'm gonna get a demo for this in a few minutes here when we go on break. Um, when the diaphragm contracts down, it allows a negative pressure to be created inside the thorax. And instead of the chest squeezing in or collapsing in, and if, you're, if you've ever done anything with firefighting, you might have noticed like the difference between soft suction and hard suction. A hard suction line is rigid and will not collapse, whereas soft suction lines are you know like what you would hook to a fire hydrant if you pull more volume into your pump than the supply provides you're going to start collapsing or making that hose line get soft another good example is if you're trying to suck too thick of a milkshake through a thin straw or a, a lightweight straw it can't fit up the straw and so the straw starts to collapse down because you've created a negative or a reduced pressure inside that straw where the atmospheric pressure is greater and collapses it. Our thorax is to keep is intended to keep that from happening. Our rib cage keeps our chest from collapsing. That way, air moves in through our airway. This is why when you get upper airway obstructions, like in a little pediatric or something who has very flexible and soft chest, soft ribs, they go to take a breath with that airway obstruction, and their whole chest collapses because as their diaphragm pulls down, the outside pressure crushes their chest in. So um, the second function is, of course, to protect the heart and its uh, circulation of blood in the body. All right, so what it's talking about here is with um, underlying medical conditions, whether that's like COPD or um, asthma or some other form of lung disease or congestive heart failure, congestive heart failure, myocarditis, cardiomegaly, uh, MIs, decreased cardiac output from whatever reason, these kind of conditions, if they already exist, and we call those comorbidities, they're a disease that already exists and works in concert with whatever the new injury is. So if one of these comorbidities already exists in the patient, a much smaller amount of trauma or insult or interruption, whatever term you want to use to describe it, much smaller incident will cause a much bigger problem. You or I, very healthy, not a lot of problems, um, no issues with our heart and lungs. Yeah, we can generally handle pretty decent trauma and be okay. But if we had half a lung, uh, left because of you know lung cancer or something, a minor amount of trauma or even a small chest injury like a broken rib could be enough to kill us because we were already operating at maximum reserve. We had no nothing left and now this trauma put us over the edge. And so that's why with your elderly or your sickly patients, so we have to um, triage higher, you know, assume that they're going to be more injured than we ex or than they appear or assume that they will respond more uh, poorly to the injuries that existed. All right. We un so during like in PHTLS and courses like that that are broken down by systems and by your assessment, your chest trauma gets uh, covered in your 
breathing chapter. So like airway is going to be face trauma, neck trauma, stuff like that. Chest trauma is going to be your breathing. Um, circulation plays a role in it, but a lot of your circulation is your um, bleeding and things along those lines because chest injuries can cause all of that or affect all of this. Of course, you have penetrating versus blunt. Um, they all have their own types. Uh, there is a huge variety in um, amongst those categories as to what they can include. Penetrating trauma can fracture ribs. It can fracture the sternum. Um, it can fracture multiple ribs or um, multiple areas of the chest. Um, we pro you've probably heard talk of a flail segment before where multiple ribs are broken. We'll see it later. But it's possible to get what's called a flail sternum where the entire sternum has been fractured away from the ribs. So there's, you know, a number of different options like that. And we're going to see more about these. All right, we mentioned the, back in mechanisms of trauma, we talked about blast injuries and talked about the primary blast injury. That is a pressure wave that causes uh, overpressurization of your hollow organs, has very little effect on your solid organs, but your hollow organs can tend to be injured pretty well uh, from it. And so your lungs can pop during that uh, pressure wave in that primary uh, shock wave. The secondary blast injury, that's where you have shrapnel creating penetrating trauma or your tertiary where the body is thrown against a solid object of some sort the ground a wall a tree whatever and then they can have blunt trauma with that or depending on the object penetrating trauma as well i mean life isn't always mortal combat but you know stranger things have happened all right so um why would thoracic trauma decrease our cardiac output let's think about that Trauma to the thorax, not specifically trauma to the heart. And I think it would be clearly understood that if you were to penetrate the heart, you know, put a hole in the heart, you're going to have a decreased cardiac output. But trauma to the chest, what does thoracic, why does thoracic trauma decrease cardiac output? Because it can cause things like pneumo or hemothorax. So it can do that. That is a huge, that is a big risk. Hemothorax is going to reduce your cardiac output because of the blood being lost, and now you have no blood to circulate. Pneumothoraxes can decrease cardiac output because it's going to um, create a pressure that squeezes the vena cava or the aorta and prevents the blood from flowing. Another thing with chest tr thoracic trauma is if the patient is... Um, has a reduction in that negative pressure like let's say they have a flail segment or something and they're not taking a deep breath you don't get that negative pressure in the chest you don't get that blood being sucked back to the core so your the blood isn't being returned to the heart so therefore with decreased cardiac preload you have de decreased cardiac output Um, all right, so we know shallow breathing. We probably all talked to a patient or dealt with a patient at one time or another that had shallow breathing. Shallow breathing can be dangerous. It can be fa fairly benign. In fact, we treat a lot of the elderly and unwell patients who have had shallow breathing for a really long time. But why is it that they can survive? Because their current metabolic rate, their oxygen needs are reduced due to... Um, you know, their condition or whatever. So they're breathing shallow, but they're not demanding as much oxygen. You take somebody like you or I, young, healthy, our bodies are fully functional. We, our basal metabolic rate is very high. We need constant supply of oxygen because we're in a growing or maintaining state versus a, a um, diminishing state of life. Um, if we were to suddenly lose half of our lung volume, due to shallow breathing, we would be getting half of the oxygen that we need to. And so that's going to have a very rapid change in our, or a rapid impact on our very, our overall health. And that's why shallow breathing can be help, uh, fatal. While shallow breathing should always be treated as a concern, when you get a 90 something year old who weighs 80 pounds in a nursing home, who's breathing shallow, that's not necessarily the same concern as a 
you know, 20 year old who weighs 140 pounds, who suddenly has shallow breathing. That could be a much greater concern. Um, of course, then, you know, we mentioned pneumos, we'll talk about that, um, and the issue with blood, uh, the pneumo or the hemo preventing lung expansion, now you're not going to get full uh, lung capacity is reduced, so there's d various ways to reduce lung capacity. Um, atelectasis is going to be a later issue with, uh, or, you know, a later complication after trauma, uh, bruised lungs. So what's a contusion? We talked about contusions a couple of weeks ago. What, what is the best description of a contusion? Everybody's on mute. So, Conyers, you guys have been quiet. <laughs> hey. Anybody but Megan. She wasn't here this morning, so she's not allowed to talk. A bruise. But what is a bruise? What is a contusion? What? How do you, do you describe that type of injury? Yes. Yes. In the simplest form terms, it is busted capillaries under the skin or in the tissue. And when the capillaries are busted, you get a lot of blood leaking into the or surrounding tissue. What is the primary function of the lungs? Don't overthink it. Yeah, gas exchange, yeah, oxygen exchange, absorbing oxygen. And where does this gas exchange take place? From where to where? Alveoli to the tissue? The alveoli to, not the tissue. Red blood cells. And the red blood cells are where? Blood. Let's think a little bit more, not quite that simple. So the, capillary. the capillaries, yes. The capillaries surround the alveoli. Inside the capillaries is the blood and the red blood cells. And the gas is being exchanged from the alveoli into the capillary. So if a bruise is a bursting or a rupture or damage to the capillaries, then a bruise on the lung means those capillaries surrounding the alveoli are leaking. Blood is not flowing through them. And so you've now lost that entire area that is contused, that is bruised. That whole area is no longer getting gas exchange. It might as well not exist because the broken capillaries are either allowing the blood to escape or vasoconstriction has shunted blood away from it. So large pulmonary contusions can be as dangerous as a... Um, a pneumothorax or something like that and it's very sudden so they could be a big problem and we'll talk a little more about those later on and so you can see that another issue is if you rupture the uh, capillaries around the alveoli you might end up rupturing the alveoli and then air is escaping as well so as a little on our patho um let's go through some of the size of i'll try to pull out the stuff that is you unique um but pulling out's not my forte. Uh, so we'll have to see how this goes. Um, so general impression, what are the three things that I've pointed out that we need to look at for our general impression? Don't look at the screen. It's not relevant to this screen. What in the past, what are three things that I have said that we need to monitor for general impression? Level of consciousness. Mm, it's not airway because we're, we, we, first of all, where does general impression happen? The moment you see the patient, so from across the room. So you're looking at their level of consciousness. Uh, no, nope, that's previous. If you think through the list, that's previous. MOI comes before general impression. General impression is the moment you put your eyes on the patient, you're going to look at their level of consciousness. 
Does anybody know what's next? I did Work of breathing, yes. So it's not airway per se. It's more their work of breathing overall, effort of breathing. So level of consciousness, work of breathing, and... Skin condition. Yeah, skin color and condition, that general appearance of them. Uh, you know, are they pale? Are they clammy? That kind of thing. So those, those we'll see later in pediatrics as the pediatric assessment triangle, but frankly, it applies to every patient of all ages. Work, um, general, bleh. General impression is level of consciousness, work of breathing, skin color and condition. That is going to tell you the main thing. And you're looking at that before you touch them. So when we're walking up to a trauma patient, we get that general impression. We want to know, do we have what's their, what do they look like their level of consciousness is? What does it look like their work of breathing is? Are they even trying? And then Another thing we add to that with trauma is as we observe their entire body, is it contorted in some weird shape that it shouldn't be in? Is there a leg where an arm should be? Um, is there some kind of major spurting blood that we need to start thinking of immediately? Are we going to look at the neck during our general impression? Actually, no because that's a much more precise and up close view, you're probably not gonna be looking for JVD and things like that during your general impression. When will you look at JVD? When you get to your airway and breathing. I go and open the airway, start adjusting head tilt, chin lift, whatever it happens to be. That's when I'm gonna look at, um, do we have JVD, tracheal midline, and stuff along those lines. So we'll also consider our spinal immobilization. Now we're doing hands-on. Now we're actually touching that patient. We're trying to open that airway. We've confirmed whether they were mentally, uh, you know, what their mental level of consciousness was. And we're assessing whether they have breathing uh, status going on. We will up expose the patient at this stage, but our patient exposure is focused on ABCs. We're exposing so we can see chest function, not so we can see every detail of their body. So um, we're not going to necessarily be trauma naked at that point. However, when we'll, we'll get to it with log rolling. All right, so thorax, yeah, symmetry, appearance, rise and fall of the chest, movement, uh, look for paradoxical motion. So when we're doing breathing, breathing with the trauma patient isn't simply a matter, is it fast, is it slow, is it deep, is it shallow? That's, and you know, that's not just breathing. We will look at those things, but we also want to look at what is going on with their chest. Is there a three foot katana sticking out of their back? Do they have a flail segment? Do they have retractions? Is there some other object or, you know, knife wound, gunshot wound? What things might impede their breathing that, though it hasn't killed them yet, is probably going to kill them pretty soon? Um, we've all probably seen the Fire Department Chronicles um, a skit on national registry tests. Uh, you know, what national registry is like versus what it, you know, what it would be like if it was realistic. And it's like, no, you failed. You missed the three-foot katana sticking out of their back. And it's like, all right, I don't treat, teach you that way. And honestly, to be perfectly honest, registry doesn't either. Um, you might have a registry proctor who's a jerk and does that to you, but that's not the way registry is intended to be. Uh, the intention of registry is to provide you with the information that should be readily visible. But if it's like, let's say your patient is lying prone on the ground, just face down, and they have a entrance wound on their anterior chest, you're not going to see that when you walk up. They might say your patient's lying face down on the ground. Okay. They're not going to tell you, oh, there's a gaping wound. But like if there was a knife stuck in their shoulder like that would be apparent through their skin or through their clothes so they would tell you and you see a, a knife sticking out of their shoulder like that's something you would notice as you walked up but like a gunshot wound or even a stab wound that was like up under their back fat or something you might not notice that until you do the assessment until you get close in on that simply because it was hidden so you kind of need to 
recognize the difference between like a major event and a minor event as to when you're observing the patient. So when we're doing breathing, we're looking for these major interruptions of breathing, things that are really going to hurt the chest. So flail segments, penetrating trauma, impaled objects, um, paradoxical motion, we're not really going to worry so much do we have contusions or point tenderness or anything like that. Not yet. We'll get there. We're still talking primary airway breathing circulation, A, B, C, D, E. All right. So we talked about that already. Um, oxygen early on. Trauma is one of the areas in EMS where we still apply large uh, high flow O2 early in the process, pretty much across the board, whether the patient is got a good O2 set or not. Whereas with like strokes and STEMIs, we avoid high flow O2 unless it's necessary. With trauma, we tend to um, apply high flow O2 earlier in an effort to improve their overall outcome. All right. Um, honestly, you should not be going to this level during the primary survey, and we'll talk. It looks like these are things you're going to want to go to, but really a lot of this is going to be far more relevant to your secondary survey. Your primary, is there something that's majorly wrong? If their airway or if their breathing pattern, you know, rate and quality and rhythm is um, off, well, then maybe we need to look a little more detail, but we're not necessarily going to go to all of this extreme during our primary because we've got to get that ABCs knocked out and make our transport decision. We'll come back to that kind of a thing. You're not going to percuss, but you will likely uh, auscultate during your primary. Your percussion is going to come later during your secondary. Um, Yeah. So, uh, what would what would clinical what clinical findings would suggest the possibility of a tamponade? JVD, good one. Yep. What else? Narrowing pulse pressure. Narrowing pulse pressure. But have we checked a blood pressure yet? So at this point, we wouldn't, but that is a very good point. It is something that will clue us in. Another one is when you're listening to your lung sounds, listen to the heart tones. You can have them take a breath, and then you can take another five seconds to listen to the heart tones. If the heart tones are muffled, that's going to indicate a tamponade. Now, you might not know muffled from normal because you're like, well, I don't know how thick this person is or how, you know, what their normal heart tone sounds like. So you get that baseline. Your initial, like you're listening to the lungs, you listen to the heart tone. Okay. And then when you do your reassessment, wait a minute, that sounds quieter than it was. That's more muffled than it was. Kind of starts heading in that direction. Does that make sense? This is a really good example of a JVD. Um, generally, we want the patient to be at a 30 to 45 degree sitting up angle. You know, that semi-fowler's position. If your patient has neck and back injuries and you're putting them on a long board, you're not going to be sitting them up to check for JVD. It's probably not that relevant. The reason you want them at that level is if they're if a person is lying down, they tend to have JVD. Their, their jugular veins tend to be more engorged when they're lying supine. But if you sit them up and their jugular veins don't drain, that's an indication of pathologic JVD. All right, so um, yeah, this is just saying that when you're doing your circulatory assessment and you're suspecting shock, it may not be isolated just to the thorax or the chest. It might be coming from another portion of the body as well. Keep that in mind. So we've done ABC, airway breathing circulation. I pointed out multiple times already, exsanguinating hemorrhage needs to be treated before that. And so with that information, we are going to make our transport decision and our transport decision is going to be based on that was their pulse faster slow stronger weak respirations faster slow deeper shallow mental status um and things like that we don't know their actual heart rate we are not worried about their actual respiratory rate and we don't know their blood pressure because we know that if we have a radial pulse we got a pressure of 80. we know if we have a carotid pulse we got a pressure of 60. We have a mental status, we have a carotid pulse. We have some form of blood pressure. And so 
Now we're going to say, well, based on this information, this is a critical patient. If they're not critical, if all of those are fairly normal findings or nothing too extreme, well, then your patient's not critical regardless of the injury they have. They may become critical, but they are not yet critical. And so that's how we base our transport decision is do we need to load and go lights and sirens emergent to a facility or are we good to play around a little bit or take our time but with all trauma we should always be looking at that golden hour having them to definitive care within uh 60 minutes of onset all right after that we move to our um History taking and our secondary assessment, our history taking should start with a vital signs. We should be pulling that in there pretty quick. Uh, but let's go ahead and we've been in here for a couple hours now, actually. So let's go ahead and stretch our legs real quick before we move on. All right, so history taking. Let's moving into our secondary assessment. A lot of time, like I said the other day, it's easy to forget that we need to do our history taking with our patients especially with the trauma patients. Um, you know, what meds, what allergies, things like that. They're not always conscious. But on top of that, you know, sample or signs, symptoms, uh, last oral intake, all of these things need to be uh, acquired if possible. But we might need to do it in route. Um, Secondary assessment, kind of. I think that history taking is really part of that. I don't necessarily look at it as being a separate concern or a separate thing, um, as much as it is part of the same um, history taking, secondary assessment, all the same thing. Especially vital signs. This is where you want to utilize your crew or utilize all the hands that you have available to you. Um, don't. Um, tunnel vision yourself into one thing and forget that there's other tasks that need to be done that you can assign other people to do. So um, and when you do that, make certain that you're keeping track of what everybody's doing. A big issue that I've seen with students when they get to, uh, they tunnel vision themselves into like assessing the airway and then assign somebody else to do sample history or something, they never end up listening when the vital signs are taken or listening to what their history and all that kind of stuff was. Um, and so as a result, the patient uh, or the, the primary provider is uninformed and you know because they're too focused. So be certain that you don't get so focused in the one skill you're doing that you miss the bigger picture of what's going on, that when you've delegated to a task to somebody, that you don't follow up and hear the results of that. So um, also don't forget you do have EKG, use it. Of course, anytime your uh, patient has a minor MOI or very isolated injury, your um, secondary assessment becomes very focused. Um, for example, my secondary assessment of a patient's chest after they got kicked by a young horse in the barnyard, you know, a single kick to the chest in the barnyard versus somebody that was thrown off a horse on a trail ride, you know, and unconscious, there's very different secondary assessments because one, we know exactly where the problem is. The other, we are not yet sure where all the potential problems are. Then this is pretty straightforward. It doesn't require a lot of injury. So one of the things with a lot of your secondary assessment findings is if that secondary assessment finding is not an actual life threat, then you will note it and move on. You will continue your entire secondary assessment and not intervene on your findings until you've completed it. The only interventions that you make are life threats. So airway, breathing, circulation, like bleeding issues. Um, a lot of people, are, and I would recommend too, that your IV should be established before your secondary assessment, especially if your primary indicates the possibility of shock. You need to establish an IV and get fluids going and such before you start doing your full secondary head to toe. I've said it before. I will say it again. Please do not forget 
always understand your secondary assessment comes second to all primary interventions. If you are busy handling primary interventions for the entire transport and cannot get to a secondary, that's okay. If you're busy trying to get vitals and keeping that airway, or not vitals, if you're busy trying to get an IV and keeping that airway open and you do not have the hands or the ability to do vital signs or get a secondary assessment, that is okay. It is not okay if you forego it when you had the ability to do it. You, If you had the ability, you should have done it. But if you don't, it, it's understandable. All right, and I mean, that plays the last one, talking about focus, this talking about uh, general multiple trauma. What is a reassessment? Somebody talk to me about what a reassessment is. Yes, reassessing all the interventions you've already done. All of the interventions, yes. So we have to reassess all the interventions. What else? You're establishing what's changed from your baseline. Yes. Watching for your trend, yes, that's another very important detail. We're looking for that trend in our vital signs and such like that. Mm -hmm. What else? I didn't hear that. I didn't hear you, Brad. Say it again. If you, oh, okay, gotcha. All right, so we've got watching the trends in your vital signs, changes from baseline, monitoring any of the interventions, you know, reassessing their interventions, making sure that they're working properly. And I think the big one to remember is reassessing all portions of the body that you didn't find injury or abnormality in in the first place. Because the patient, you may have done your initial care of that or assessment of that patient and their abdomen was fine but a abdominal trauma like a hemorrhage or something could show up later. So you wanna wait, not wait, every time you do a reassessment, you recheck that. If the injury existed and you said, we have a broken leg, well, it's still broken. We don't need to go back there again, but areas that were not injured the first time, continue to reassess them so that you can see if the latent injury is developing, like the contusions, the swelling, um, perhaps like, for example, a pelvic fracture, if the patient is conscious initially and they're um, in a lot of pain and discomfort, their muscle contractions can make the pelvis feel stable. But if they were to go unresponsive or if you were to sedate them and intubate them or something, now their muscles relax and their pelvis may not be stable anymore. So a reassessment would indicate or it would show the sudden problem with that pelvis. So when we're talking about chest trauma, you know, you might have initially checked lung sounds and heart tones and everything was fine. But the reassessment will say, oh, look, here we have diminished lung sounds or absent lung sounds because of the developing pneumo or now we have muffled heart tones or something along those lines. All right. Um, so anything, anytime you have a pneumothorax, no matter how severe that pneumo is, if you're suspecting it, um, and we're not even talking about it having to be tension, but if you are suspecting a pneumothorax, that patient would be considered unstable. Of course, all sta unstable patients, we're reassessing every five minutes versus every 15 for the stable patients. But what it's saying here is even if your heart rate, O2 sat, and blood pressure are all relatively stable with that pneumo, you're still an unstable patient because it's a pneumo and, or like you're suspecting that pneumo. Always treat for the worst and hope for the best. Always assume there is the pneumo when there isn't. If there's reason to believe it exists or could have existed, assume it does until proven otherwise. That way you don't miss or under triage your patients. Over triage is always better than under triage. Some of you may not work in a region that has rapid access to multiple trauma centers or different levels of trauma care, but remember it is always better to take a drunk to a trauma center than a head bleed to a non-trauma center.
if that makes any sense, if you can understand what I'm saying there. It is always better to take someone to the trauma center because they might be a head, a head bleed, even if it is just alcohol intoxication, than to take a person who has a head bleed to the local hospital thinking it was just a drunk. Does that make sense? This means yes, this means no. Any feedback? Okay. Thank you, Ashley. Appreciate it. At least somebody's awake. Uh, all right. Um, so I think that makes sense. All right. Airway adjuncts. We've, we're not really chest injuries. Don't really include a whole lot of concerns with airway adjuncts. We're not, you know, we're not there. We're talking about breathing, but um, chest injuries can be heavily impacted by ET tubes. Our ET tube may play a big role in doing that um, in chest injuries. For example, if a patient has cracked ribs or a flail segment, the ET tube is the best way to control that airway and actually a really good way to control that flail segment. However, if the patient has a pneumothorax, that ET tube is going to exacerbate that pneumo. It's going to cause the pneumo to develop faster than it would have on its own because of the way, because of positive pressure ventilation. All right. Um, yep. Circulatory support, fluids, uh, blood products if available. Um, what are we gonna do for pain? Well, remember you have non-pharmacologic methods as well as pharmacologic. Non-pharmacologic methods are going to include a, um, you know, positioning the patient, uh, relieving pain, you know, maybe bending their knees if necessary uh, to get some of that pressure off their abdomen. Uh, pain, uh, splinting. Um, Controlled breathe, controlling their breathing, you know, coaching their breathing, uh, psychological, emotional type support, things along those lines, um, possibly even an ice pack or something. But when we're dealing with chest trauma, chest trauma can create a whole lot of really negative conditions pretty quick. Even a minor rib fracture, you know, single simple rib fracture can cause pneumonia and can lead to death in certain populations because that pain prevents prevents the patient from breathing adequately. It keeps them from taking deep breaths, it keeps them from clearing their lungs, and it puts them at predisposes them for pneumonia, which can lead to death in the immunocompromised uh, patients. So with rib or chest injuries, we want to be a little bit more aggressive with our pain management. Dope to the high end on the meds, right? So if you can give fentanyl shoot for your high dose of fentanyl because you really want to relieve that pain in an effort to um, and facilitate more effective breathing. If the patient stops breathing, you have overdosed them. This is irresponsible and not recommended. But what do we do? We can A, give them Narcan and then they're back in pain or B, ventilate them with a BVM and maintain their airway. While I'm not advocating for overdosing, please don't misunderstand me. Overdosing is able to be recovered from, especially if you can recognize it. You realize, oh, that's what's going on. We'll just bag for them. We'll ventilate them. Or we'll give them a touch of Narcan to back it off a little. Whatever it happens to be. Fentanyl is really good because while, yes, you can overdose them, it doesn't last as long. So it'll uh, if you did give more than you sh needed to, it will wear off pretty quick and it's not like morphine that's going to be there for a while or ketamine that's going to be a much more challenging situation. So I, you know, I'm a big fan of fentanyl when it comes to treating trauma patients. You know, generally by the time we're arriving at the hospital, our dose of fentanyl is wearing off and they're uh, ready for a new dose. Again, I'm not talking cavalier. I'm not trying to be flippant. Overdosing your patient on medication is dangerous and irresponsible, but it is recoverable. It's not the end of, uh, you know, the, the end of everything. You know, it, it's not. It's not necessarily the a disaster, and it can, if you handle it right, be less of a problem than underdosing that patient and not providing adequate pain relief. Um, also, I think a lot of people. Uh, significantly underestimate the um, what a maximum dose would be or what a danger you know overdose would be it is not a hundred micrograms now if you have a five-year-old a hundred micrograms would be an overdose but like for the average adult a hundred micrograms of fentanyl is really not going to overdose them um, I'm not saying that you hit them straight off the bat with 200 micrograms of fentanyl 
but you might in a period of 10 or 15 minutes have to get up to that dose level in order to get the pain medication the pain uh, relief that you need for that patient to breathe deeply and adequately and prevent them from developing a pneumo or not a pneumo uh, pneumonia or and adequately supply oxygen and gas exchange remember your doses of opiates in the back of the ambulance for that trauma care is not what it takes to put that to make that patient a drug addict it is not our opiate intervention that causes that dependence they that will come later down the road with oral opiates on a chronic use basis our pre-hospital care is not going to create that issue so don't be afraid of that treat the patient's pain get them out of pain especially in our chest chest injuries that will improve their chances of recovery but I mean, I think what it's saying here, talking about clinical state, local pro, uh, and transport times, is if you're focused on getting that patient to definitive care and you're busy handling other necessary interventions, those take precedence over pain relief. Pain relief is going to come after, like, your fluids are being administered, your airways being controlled, your breathing's being controlled, things like that. All right, we already mentioned some non-pharmacologic methods. Um, I've talked about the golden hour several times. All right, so here's flail chest. We've mentioned it. I brought it up. Flail chest is three or more, excuse me, two or more ribs broken in two or more places. The picture has three ribs in it, but it is two or more ribs broken in two or more places, creating a segment of the rib that moves opposite or separate from the rest of the rib cage. So while my diaphragm contracts and my chest wall moves out due to the muscle function, spread the flail segment would move opposite so as my chest wall moves out the flail segment would move in when my chest wall is moving in the flail segment pops out and that's paradoxical motion it's moving opposite of everything else and this is incredibly painful for your patient because every time they breathe those bone tips those rib ends are rubbing against each other like so and it's very, very painful for them. And this is why we want to um, give them that pain medication. In Historically, if you've talked to some of the older school providers, even people who went to paramedic school when I did, you know, in the early 2000s, many of us were taught that the treatment of a flail segment would be to take like a bag of saline, a bulky dressing, or a pillow or something and place it over that injury, pressing it in and holding it in place so that as they breathe, that segment wasn't moving so much. Great idea. I hear what you're saying. It makes sense. But if you have a segment of the rib cage that is broken loose and is now not moving in concert and you're pushing it into their chest, what have you done to the internal volume of that chest? Anybody? What'd you say? Who are you trying to answer the question, Roswell? I thought I heard Roswell trying to say something. So the question is, if you take a bulky substance dressing or whatever and press in on that flail segment what have you done to the internal volume of the chest just the volume yeah you've reduced it so now there's less lung capacity less lung volume in a patient who frankly is in need of their lung volume so this is why things like bulky dressings sandbags saline bags and pillows and such are no longer recommended for the flail segment patient. The best way to treat a flail segment patient is to use positive pressure ventilation um, and pain medication. Um, I, you know, dope them up really good on that fentanyl, get them to feel better, and then use the BVM or the CPAP. The CPAP can be a good option. Um, if the patient has a good, a good LOC, good blood pressure, and is breathing um, adequately on their own, because with that constant inhale, that's not going to move as much when they um, 
exhale. Um, there, there's, it's going to have more pressure forcing it in and keep it, um, keep that segment from sliding back and forth. But the best is honestly an intubation followed by positive pressure ventilation. This would require sedation and probably uh, paralytics of some sort, which means the patient is now, because of the sedation, pain free. So all the way around, you've really improved their outcome this way. So um, positive uh, intubation and pain relief sedation like that is probably the best treatment of flail segment. If all else, if you don't have RSI available, then CPAP or positive pressure BVM ventilations is the preferred um, treatment for flail segments. Now, we brought this up earlier. We talked about pulmonary contusions. We established that a contusion is a rupture of our capillaries. In our lungs, our lungs are almost exclusively a bunch of little air sacs called alveoli surrounded by capillaries. You start rupturing those capillaries, you have a reduction or you have blood loss through them and a lack of function. So that's an alveoli that doesn't function. No gas exchange, no um, oxygen and blood exchange through there. Also, with those ruptured alveoli and ruptured capillaries, you're going to start getting f blood into the alveoli spaces. So when you listen to the lung sounds, it'll start to sound crackly or wet, as kind of like you would hear with pneumonia or even a CHF patient. <laughs> um, but as you can see, some lung contusions could be rather large, covering a large portion of that lung. Um, in that case, like in the case of this patient, that could be a near fatal contusion if that much of the lung is not functioning. If there's enough force exerted on the chest to fracture multiple ribs in multiple places, then there's a really good chance that it has caused uh, pulmonary contusions underneath the lung as well, or underneath the ribs on the, on the lung. <laughs> yes, hemothoraxes can pop the lung, leading to hemo and pneumothorax not pneumothorax, flail segments can pop the lung leading to a pneumo or a hemothorax as well. And then we'll talk about pneumos in a minute. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't feel like these need to be explained. Seems pretty straightforward. So here's an example of an X. Here's a great X-ray of some rib fractures. You can see even the minor displacement on a couple of those rib fractures. But we have one, two, three, four, five rib fractures at minimum there. Uh, actually, the maybe only four. Um, that bottom one might be the cartilage junction, not the rib fracture. Um, all right, so... <clears throat> I, just like with the flail segments that I mentioned before, the pain is causing them to not take a deep breath. And so while they're not going to have um, uneven breathing, you know, like uh, bilateral or unilateral chest wall movement, the rib fracture can't prevent one side of the chest from expanding. The only thing that'll cause that is a pneumo. Um, they will probably be sitting there holding that rib. They may even want to put a pillow there and hold it with their hand because what they're trying to do is keep that one rib from separating or stretching. Um, they used to wrap people's chest with ace bandages and such. Um, there is some thought about like taping it with a very strong adhesive tape that will hold the chest there intact so that rib doesn't keep pulling away from each other. That that is very unique and won't work on most people because of the adipose tissue and the, you know, the stretchiness of their skin. But uh, wrapping their chest with a rib fracture is not a good idea because you're preventing it from expanding. And if you constrict their chest too much and they can't expand their chest with their breath, they have decreased uh, respiratory uh, numbers, decreased tidal volume, and all that, which will lead to hypoxemia, uh, hypercarbia, and ultimately pneumonial atelectasis. So um, many times though that patient's self-splinting with their hand, that's perfectly acceptable. They're controlling it. They're not reducing their lung volume. And then, but the best treatment for that is going to be cause, um, 
providing them with pain relief. They don't necessarily need positive pressure ventilation. It can be useful, but it's not necessarily required. However, um, pain relief is probably the biggest help here. So you can see when you have a rib fracture in four to nine, these are your injuries that could be associated with it. But then nine through 11, abdominal injuries are kind of big. You wanna start looking at that. Look for liver, spleen, uh, kidney injuries and things along those lines. Mm. All right, so pleuritic chest pain is that sharp pain every time they take a deep breath in one area, or it doesn't even have to be a deep breath, but very localized pinpoint pain. You may have crepitus, you may not, um, but you're probably going to have the tenderness and uh, contusions and things along those lines. Subcutaneous emphysema tends to be a much later finding and also it's got to be a pretty severe rib fracture to rupture the lung and then allow the lung, the air to leak out of the lung into um, the subcutaneous space. So, um, Gently splinting the chest wall. This could be as simple as the patient keeping their hand there or giving them a pillow to sit there and just hold it. You're not tight taping it to them. You're not wrapping it to them. You're just giving them that pillow to sit there and kind of hug it gently. That and then giving them analgesics is the best way to handle a rib fracture. I realize that for the flail segment, I said do not use pillows, do not use saline bags or bulky dressings. And that is very much because you could reduce their um, internal lung volume with those, but with the rib fracture, you're not reducing their internal chest volume. So you can give them a pillow for them to sit there and hug, and that will, could very likely um, reduce that, disc, that pain. So, um, now this is a sternal fracture. Notice here, this is a, a, or a lateral view of the thorax and we have a very clear sternal fracture um, right in the middle of the sternum. This isn't even at the uh, manubrium. Um, so that's slap in the middle of the sternum. This could be blunt force trauma. This could be caused by CPR, uh, although blunt force trauma of some other form is probably more likely. Um, it could flail. You can get a flail mediastinum. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, Basically, all the frac all the ribs around that section are broken, and so the whole center of their chest is broken loose. I've seen this a number of times on patients uh, who are in cardiac arrest, specifically in a nursing home. Uh, probably a patient who should have had a DNR signed for their own sake. Um, you know, you're talking about the elderly, emaciated individual who's in end stage cancer and is already. Um, unresponsive mentally and cognitively unaware but yet is still um, living in a nursing home on a g-tube these kind of patients where you know they weigh 80 pounds soaking wet and you do cpr on them and you crack all the ribs and the next thing you realize you don't have any chest wall recoil because the mediastinum is broken free of the ribs and it's hanging over there or the sternum's broken free of the ribs and it's just sitting there <clears throat> I did see uh, on a patient exactly like that one time, I did see subcutaneous emphysema because the ribs being so fractured from the sternum had punctured the lung and then enough of the skin was ex exposed due to that dislocate, you know, the, the complete disassociation of the ribs and the sternum that air, when they intub we intubated, air filled up the subcutaneous tissue and actually started causing the arm and the chest, the breast tissue going up the neck and all of that to start swelling up with subcutaneous emphysema. It was quite uh, dramatic. It was a really cool example of sub-Q and you could feel the crackling. You could feel that tissue uh, crunching that is described with it. Um, uh, so unpleasant obviously for the patient you know i'm not wishing that on anyone but it was a really interesting uh experience and learning opportunity fortunately i had some students nearby that day and i was able to show them and it made a great learning opportunity for them as well <laughs> all right um So clavicle fractures, these do can, 
uh, count as a um, chest wall or you know a thoracic injury. Uh, most of the time, this is caused by falling on something. We see this a lot with kids. You may even see this with wrestling when somebody gets flipped over and lands on their shoulder, cracking the clavicle. Um, you'll see a drooping shoulder on that one side. It'll hang low. But most of the time, the patient's going to want to hold their arm up because that raises their arm back up and straightens out that fractured clavicle. Best thing to do, sling and swath with their arm like this. You know, support that arm up, wrap it around their chest and hold that arm up. Pain medication as necessary. <clears throat> the Olicron process of the ulna that's down here at the base underneath their elbow right here. So you're lifting up on that providing support there to raise that shoulder up and then if it's the left shoulder for example that's fractured you want to put the sling and the swath knot over here on the right um not you know front or back of the neck or something but go opposite side all right so um now after rib fractures and um flail segments a lot of times you're going to end up with a pneumothorax and you with pneumos we have three different categories that we normally consider you have your simples your tensions and um oh crap why did i my brain it's only the two maybe oh spontaneous that was that was where i was getting the third one but we're not really talking spontaneous we're just worried about the simple and the tension pneumos simple pneumos Air is in the pleural space outside the lung where it doesn't belong, generally because one of two things have happened. The, rung, the lung tissue has been punctured and air is leaking out of that lung, the parechymal space, into that pleural space. Or there is a puncture through the rib cage into the pleural space and air is being pulled in th through a sucking chest wound. Now, for that to happen, you have to have a fairly significant hole. For example, most like hunting arrows and stuff, or um, or at least I should say maybe the target tips, but most arrows and most like uh, 22 caliber, even 223 caliber, low, you know, a small caliber firearms will not create a large enough hole into the chest to create a sucking chest wound because you have a very large diameter trachea in your throat, right? S pulling air through. Well, that hole in your lungs needs to be at least one quarter of the size of the, your trachea. So it's got to be a significant, but it's not one quarter of the size in the skin. One quarter of the size all the way through into the chest. Because when most of the time a puncture wound happens in the, tish, in the chest, the muscle or the fat that is underneath the skin squeezes into that hole and seals it off. So that's why it's got to be a really big projectile to blow a hole through the chest that leaves that much of an opening on the inside where it didn't essentially self-seal. And this is why a lot of chest wounds, a lot of GSWs are not actually sucking chest wounds because they're self-sealing on their own. That doesn't mean you don't need to treat them. You still put the occlusive dressing on them to make certain. But that's why... Your sucking chest wound is not nearly as likely as your um, frac uh, ruptured lung, ruptured parechymal tissue, and then the air leaking into the pleural space from there. Hi, Bryce. Yes, sir. The, uh, doesn't the hole of the penetrating trauma have to be the same size as the trachea or bigger for it to be a... Seems like I remember something like that. Have you ever heard that? I, I have heard that, but it's actually not completely the case because the um, friction loss, the length of the trachea, is longer than the distance between the outer surface of the skin and the inside of the pleural space for most people. And so it only has to be like a quarter to half the size of the trachea in order to be at risk of a sucking chest wound. But like I said, it it's not that... like. You might argue that a 45 ACP, you know, 45 caliber uh, projectile is almost the same size or nearly the same size as the trachea, right? But for your average American who weighs 280 pounds, a 45 through the chest, while lethal, 
there's going to be enough subcutaneous tissue and muscle to squeeze into that hole. And your actual hole all the way through may not be that large. Does that make sense? It's not the full 45, you know, half an inch diameter. Does, is that, you following what I'm saying? So even if they were hit with a 50 caliber, you know, a half inch diameter, diameter projectile is the hole all the way through that diameter. And that's why your stab wounds are actually far more likely to cause a sucking chest wound simply because most knives are larger in some sense and could create a bigger um, hole that way. So you got to think that friction loss between the throat. In general, yes, you would want it to be roughly this. It would have to be roughly the same size in order to suck in through that hole. But the length of your airway plays a big role in that as well. But good question. Thank you. All right. So small pneumothoraxes. This is where you have unequal chest breath sounds, diminished breath sounds on one time. On one side, you may have hyper residence. This is means when you palpate it during your secondary, or not palpate, percuss. You place your hand on this, on the bone or on the chest, and then slap your hand. You know, you can do this with your fingers or with your knuckles or something. You're not punching them in the chest you're putting your hand and then hitting your hand and you're listening to hear that sound as to whether or not you have a much more hollow sound than normal that is your simple they may have some pain well they will have some pain and they may have some shortness of breath your larger pneumos as you can see much more likely to have shortness of breath or much more significant short, shortness of breath and then other signs of respiratory compromise. Their O2 sats are starting to change. Their respiratory rate may be significantly increased and things like that. These are all still simple. It's not tensioned yet. What do we do? Well, provide the occlusive dressing to prevent it from uh, sucking air further in and, and progressing. Um, make certain that they have oxygen if um, to maintain uh, saturations in the area of the lung that is functioning. Um, you may need to be prepared to provide ventilatory support. Keep in mind that providing ventilatory support to a simple pneumo can quickly turn it into a tension pneumo. <laughs> because as you continue to push air into the, those lungs through positive pressure ventilation, you're going to push the air into the lungs and then out of that hole in the lungs into the pleural space. All right, I've been kind of like hitting this whole open pneumo versus closed the whole time. So simples would be closed, open would be open, right? We got the punched a hole through the chest wall. Kind of already um, mentioned the size and concern there. Here you can see how it's opening. Um, so. If the hole is larger, then it is likely to enter the chest. But again, if the hole, it doesn't even have to be that much larger. It just has to have a hole all the way through the chest wall that is patent. Um, my brother is the one that taught me the part about the half to a quarter inch diameter of the trachea that he shown that by a trauma surgeon that that's all the bigger it needed to be to be sucking. But again, it has to be a patent hole constantly allowing air to flow through. Younger, skinnier people who don't have a lot of adipose tissue are at a greater risk of that. <clears throat> so what, what's the meme that goes around? I'm not fat, I'm bulletproof. So, all right. Um, right. Uh, when you have these open pneumos, you can end up with a lot of bleeding into the tissue or into the space as well because the vasculature is damaged. And so not only is air leaking in, but also blood is leaking into that area. Um, and then you're going to have, if that lung is collapsed or collapsing and there's ruptured damage to that vascular, well, that blood is going to be just pumping into the uh, open pleural cavity here. It's a, it looks like a stab wound right there. Um, remember, not all stab wounds to the chest actually enter the uh, rib cage and into the pleural spaces. You've got ribs for a reason, and they can deflect a lot of your um, low-velocity objects. Uh, 
Knives will often hit the ribs and then deflect along beside them or uh, get stuck between them and not penetrate into the lung cavity. Um, what would you look for to indicate that it did? Well, the patient's vital signs will trend towards that pneumo. It'll trend towards an instability. Or you might see the bubbling of air around that wound or sucking in and out. Like you might see the uh, wound close when they take a deep breath and then open when they exhale or something like that. These are possibilities. Again, if you're not seeing that, it may not be all the way through the chest cavity. Ran a patient one night was convinced, I mean, he'd been stabbed in the chest. He was unconscious when we got to him. Um, his vital, his heart rate was already in the 70s. So when we're thinking, holy crap, he's already about to code. Throw him in the truck, start rolling down the road. His blood pressure's fine. His heart rate's not changed. It's still in the 70s. He's very confused when we're able to get him to uh, talk to us. So we're saying, turns out he was just drunk as a skunk. But he, had, when he got stabbed in the chest, the knife had gone up. It had come up this way at him instead of straight into the chest. And so it didn't penetrate his chest wall and into his uh, lung. It had gone up along his rib cage, up into his pec muscle, and never entered the actual thorax. So isn't he, he got off quite lucky because it was a pretty significant size uh, wound under his pectoral uh, muscle. <clears throat> All right, so I think we kind of covered that. What do we do? Seal it. So this is the Osherman chest seal. Uh, this is a newer version of it or a variation of it. There's the, uh, the original version had like a little flutter valve in the middle of it. Uh, the idea was that chest seal would um, allow air to escape back out when they were exhaling, but prevent air from sucking in. When you had like a military level chest wound, that might be necessary. When you have a large chunk of their chest missing, they were hit with shrapnel or something like that, that may be necessary. You might be beneficial there. But with a lot of the chest wounds that we see in the civilian world, where we're talking like uh, small caliber handguns or rifles, even shotgun pellets, flying projectiles and things, we don't tend to see these large chest wounds that have like chunks of rib missing and things like that. You know, not like a shrapnel or bomb shrapnel chest wound. So when we don't have that the concern with the sucking and the, the valve isn't near as much of a uh, big of a deal simply the best plan is to place this complete seal an occlusive dressing over it close it off seal it on all four sides um phcls you might have read old textbooks said you do a three-sided dressing so it'll uh ventilate back out again ventilating and back out is so rare that it it doesn't matter. There's nothing wrong with doing a three-sided dressing, but it's not really going to benefit anything, which is why you can see the one chest seal here that completely uh, covers it. There's no valve. It's just a, a complete seal. Because most penetrating wounds to the chest don't actually bleed very much, the majority of the blood is lost into the chest cavity. Uh, there's really not a lot of external bleeding. One of the quickest ways to seal off a chest wound is with a tagaderm. I've found. I'll just dry the wound off with some gauze or something and then slap an IV tagaderm over the hole and now you've sealed it off. If the tagaderm comes off, that's a concern. You obviously you're going to maybe put some more tape around it or whatever, but as long as you've dried off that tissue, the tagaderm should stick pretty well. This is because most of the chest wounds that we're going to come in contact with are low small caliber rounds or small caliber, uh, small diameter penetrations. A truly open sucking chest wound that you can vent, you know, vent uh, out or release the pressure from does not not typically become a pneumo because you've sealed it off, you've stopped the air from entering, and then, or tension, I mean, you've sealed it off, you prevent the air from entering, so then it doesn't tension, or you can remove the seal, press, on their chest, burp that air back out, remove that air, and uh, ventilate or and um, relieve that tension. All right, so tension pneumo. What's the difference between a simple or open pneumo and a tension pneumo? And the long and the short of it is their blood pressure has dropped. 
This is the patient that you know has a pneumo, you've identified the absent lung sounds, you have chest wall injury, and their O2 sat's trending down, their heart rate is trending up, and now all of a sudden their blood pressure starts dropping. This is what we would consider hemodynamically unstable. Their tension or their pneumo is now large enough to reduce blood flow into or out of the chest. And we need to intervene. We need to act quickly to needle decompress this. This is not get a 18-gauge um, IV catheter. This is a 14-gauge chest decompression needle. Most 14-gauge IV catheters that are an inch and a half long are not long enough to reach into the pleural space with the average American. You really need those three, three and a half inch long chest decompression needles to get deep enough into the pleural space to ventilate that. You'll, enter, you'll insert the needle into the appropriate location, which would be midclavicular, second, third intercostal space, or uh, midaxillary, fourth, fifth intercostal space. Now there's some, that second, third intercostal space on the uh, anterior axillary, which is basically right here, just at the front of the armpit. Um, the idea is if the patient's wearing some form of body armor, you can insert the needle that way into the chest, it basically in their armpit, and not have to remove their body armor. You would hear an immediate relief of air pressure, and then you'll probably note that their blood pressure improves pretty quickly after that. It is possible if it tensioned once, it can tension again. You have not solved the problem. You've not healed them. You've simply relieved that pressure. If it tensions a second time, drop another needle. There's no, it is highly unlikely the first needle is still patent or functional. So the, the idea of putting like a flutter valve on it or a three-way stopcock or something like that, probably not going to be necessary because any movement of the ribs could compress or crush that catheter and then it's just not going to be effective for pulling the air out. So um, go ahead and drop another needle in their chest right next to the first one. Of course, in the same intercostal space. All right. Um, yeah, I already mentioned all that. So absent breath sounds, unequal chest rise, pulses paradoxes, pulses disappear when they take a breath, uh, tachycardia, dysrhythmias, JVD is a big one. So that's probably your biggest indicator uh, difference between a pneumo and a hemo is that the JVD is present in the pneumo, but not the hemo. The, the pneumothorax is squeezing the blood out of the heart or preventing it from entering the heart. So it's backing up on the venous side, whereas the pneumo, or excuse me, where the hemo is blood is filling the void, filling the pleural space, and draining the vasculature. So there is no blood to back up. So there's not going to get JVD on a hemothorax. Yeah, I mean, this is this is all the same. They're just saying the same things over again. Um, Tracheal deviation is possible with attention pneumo, but it is a very, very, very late finding and tends to be rather hard to identify because their chest wall, or excuse me, because their trachea and the bifurcation of the trachea is so deep into the chest that uh, most of the time there's enough structure of muscle and adipose tissue and such around the neck that you can't see the trachea deviate. But if it does, it's going to deviate away from the effective side. Do you need to have a syringe and all this fanciness? No, not at all. You need a chest need chest decompression needle. You put it in, you hear the pressure relief, boom. That's all you need to do. You don't need to worry about putting a seal on it. You don't need to worry about a three-way stopcock. You don't need to do a syringe um, and draw that air out and do all it. It's probably gonna be a lot more air than that syringe can handle. It'll ventilate on its own. Now, once you drop that needle and you hear that pressure release, sure. Grab a syringe, pull a couple of syringes of air out if you can. That would be great. But really the fact that you have removed the pressure is what's going to make the biggest difference. What's going to happen as soon as they get to the hospital, they're going to put in a chest tube, which will put them on a constant suction to remove that pressure. <laughs> I've kind of been mentioning the hemo the whole time. It's just blood filling the lung. If this patient had a hemo that was the size of the lung that way, I mean, you could put 3,000 milliliters of blood 
in one pleural space, just one lung volume, one lung area, not both. That's six units of blood. And most of us have like seven to eight, maybe nine units at most of blood in our body. So that's two thirds, half to two thirds of our blood volume in one pleural space. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, you know, one one lung space could be the equivalent of a thirty a three liter bottle of Coke, you know, 3000 milliliter. So that's a lot of blood. Um, so probably dead, probably not even a concern because they bled out. There's no blood to be carried around. It's a great x-ray of one showing all that uh, blood in that um, on the uh, patient's right. So looking at the picture, it's the one side on the left, all the white. Um, that's a hemo. What are we going to do? Drive fast. That's all we can. We cannot remove that blood. We can't fix it. They need surgeons. So um, a hemo, a massive hemo is considered whenever it's more than 1,500 milliliters. Like I said, it can be a whole lot more than that in that space. Uh, hemo pneumos, when you have them both, when you both air, most of the time that's what we have is a hemo and a pneumo. If the tissue is damaged to cause air to leak into there, it's bleeding. And so you're going to have a little bit of blood. I already mentioned this, flat neck veins, no tracheal deviation. Um, maybe they're coughing up blood. You're gonna have dullness. I didn't mention that before. Dullness, instead of hearing hyperresonance, wherever the blood is, you'll have a dullness. Yeah. Treat them for hemorrhagic shock. That's what you're treating them for. And I mentioned contusions earlier. I feel like I've already said it several times, but one of the things to look for with the contusion, because we're talking about the fracturing or the bursting of the capillaries along the alveoli, is you're going to start having wet lung sounds. Later, this can result in atelectasis, not generally initially. So, um... How would you know? Well, look for the, if there's a contusion on the outside of the chest, probably one on the inside. And the rest of those are just findings of rib fractures and flail segments. Um, all right, let's take a quick break. We've been here a while, so let's take a quick break before we get to this last couple of segments here. All right, cardiac tamponade. Mentioned it earlier a little bit. This is generally caused by blunt force trauma to the heart and could be caused by penetrating trauma to the heart or at least partially penetrating. Um, not necessarily high velocity like uh, GSWs, but it could be low velocity like a knife wound or medium velocity like an arrow or something like that. Uh, yes, there is a loss of fluid into the pericardial sac, so you have blood loss, but it's not really big as so much of a blood loss, a blood volume issue, as much as when you start to compress that or fill the pericardial sac with blood, the sac does not stretch. It's a fibrous sac and has very little uh, elasticity to it. So it starts to compress the muscle of the heart in. While the muscle can compress some, the majority of your movement or compression is going to be the result of the internal volume, the ventricles being uh, reduced, you know, being compressed and squeezed in on themselves. And so that volume is reduced. As that volume is reduced, you have less blood flowing into the ventricles and therefore less blood flowing out of the ventricles. This uh, reduces your total cardiac output. Uh, of course, how fast it develops and how severe of a condition it is is all going to be based on the type of injury and severity of the injury which chambers involve lots of variables here the thing we're going to notice is the jvd we're going to see narrowing pulse pressures we're going to see muffled heart tones and that's called beck's triad jvd muffled heart tones and narrowed pulse pressures blood pressure will go down but your systolic and diastolics will be getting closer together so Beck's triad, remember that. Um, now, medical tamponades, we'll talk more about in the medical section. These are normally caused by pericarditis, endocarditis, 
are uh, epicarditis, not endocarditis. Um, so these are infection is basically pus building up around the heart causing the compression whereas trauma it is from bleeding and tends to form very rapidly um unfortunately while most of the time even if you were able to decompress it which is possible in certain areas certain parts of the country pericardial synthesis that's the name of the procedure can be performed by paramedics not here in the state of Georgia, and I'm going to bet it's not in the state of Mississippi, but in some areas it is. If you were to perform pericardial synthesis and remove the pressure, if it was caused by trauma, it will likely return and return rather rapidly. And that is now just blood volume that you've lost. Um, while that's not really that much blood volume, it is still lost blood volume and it is very much a stopgap. It is a very short-term fix. You've got to get that patient to surgery. Well, you do the same thing for a medical patient caused by pericarditis or something, your time frame, because it was so slow and progress in developing, it will benefit the patient much longer. And so this is why you might find this within scope of practice in areas like um, Alaska or Montana or somewhere out where you're several hours from a hospital. And so that uh, pericardial synthesis could buy you the time necessary to make it to a surgeon. Um, while with trauma patients, it's generally not going to buy you that much time uh, simply because it's going to return pretty quickly. And uh, most of the time we're at a facility with, sur with doctors uh, quicker than that or than is required or is necessary so therefore we don't see this as much of a problem and we don't see it in our protocols very often um notice also that only like, like it's saying only 40 to 50 percent have bex triad the um, muffled heart tone hypotension jvd while this does exist i, I mean you can have basically you can have a tamponade without that this means that really you're only going to see all three of these at very extreme tamponades and they don't all go that extreme so electrical alternons is a really unique finding that you can uh that you run into with per, um pericardial tamponade let me pull up a picture of that I, actually no i told you didn't i show you that i showed you guys electrical alternons uh back in cardiology if i remember right but electrical alternons is a alteration or change of the QRS size with, through um, with each uh, contraction. Because the pericardial tamponade is allowing uh, the heart to move around within the sac, the sac is no longer holding it per perfectly tight, you get this change um, you had this change or alteration from one contraction to the next. So uh, let's see if I can zoom in on that. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. All right. So you can see how your QRSs are of different height and shape as we go along here. And that is the, um, the heart itself moving within the pericardial sac, creating a um, change of your axis as it moves through. So you ought to be able to, should be able to see that right here. I did that. So call back up. All right. All right. So yeah. Any other thing, obstructive shock that causes a decrease of cardiac output? These are your symptoms that are associated with cardiac tamponade. Oops. Um. <sighs> very very so this is a really good chart i would be very familiar with this chart not saying that this is going to be absolutely tested but these are really important distinctions between the two findings tamponade and pneumothorax they love to bring these up in tests registry likes to look at them you know which of these is the more likely cause of injury so on and so forth so i would be very familiar with these concepts and understand why i feel like whenever you're looking at stuff like this 
It's great to know that there's differences. It's great to be able to memorize a little chart like this. But if you don't understand why, why is one causing shock and one causing distress or why is one causing midline or deviated, you know, what's the difference there? Then you're not going to be able to figure it out, figure out what's going on and fully understand it. It's like when you can ex understand or explain the the reason why, then you have a better grasp on the uh, issue overall. Mm -hmm. Hypothetically, if you had a cardiac tamponade and a pneumothorax at the same time, which one is the more pressing concern? The pneumo. Uh, the pneumo is probably the more pressing concern, um, simply because a greater volume of blood and or air can be lost due to the pneumo created and have that impact, whereas the heart... Um, the, the tamponades are fairly self-limiting. They do cause a big problem, but they are fairly self-limiting. Um, not to say you won't die from it, but they tend to develop slower than the pneumo. Um, also, your pneumo is something that you can intervene with, whereas your tamponade, typically you can't intervene with it. So I would focus or be more concerned of the pneumo. Does that help? But good question. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, yeah, fluids, air, um, oxygen, trauma center, get them there fast. High flow diesel to bright lights and cold steel. So this is pericardial synthesis. It's almost, uh, that's, eh, you know, sometimes that's about where the needle will go. Normally it might be a little further down on the pericardial sac. What they do is they take a very large syringe and needle and i think i've got a um, bamboo skewer here patients lying supine on the stretcher uh, you'll find this xiphoid process right there you have this very large needle attached to and it, it's long it's like a six inch long needle so it's specifically for this purpose attached to like a 60 cc syringe and you insert it at like a 45 degree angle up from the abdomen into the chest and you're um, going up to the heart itself. And uh, sometimes there's, they've talked, I've heard stuff describing using a uh, EKG lead on the needle so that you're getting a, uh, a read, but honestly, you're gonna start getting a read the moment it passes through the skin. So monitor their EKG. Um, once you start to see some irritation, um, like some PVCs popping up, that is a good indication that it's a uh, that you're in the uh, pericardial sac or maybe even in the muscle and you've gone too far. Uh, what's generally recommended is that you have the syringe compressed or you know closed. You insert it into the skin and then you start pulling suction on the syringe as you advance the needle up under the rib cage towards the heart in this direction like this and then as soon as the needle passes through the pericardial sac you'll start pulling you know evacuating it and you'll start pull, uh, getting blood or fluid into your syringe and now you know you're you know you've made it and it's pretty much you just stop at that point so that you don't advance the needle into the uh, ventricle muscle wall um, it is a fairly simple procedure when you think about it but it has a lot of uh, risk for negative outcome myocardial contusions are going to look and seem very much like an mi that may even show up on the monitor as an mi so this is one of those things that you want to think about um was the patient having chest pain prior to the accident? Now you look at the monitor, they hit the steering wheel, they fell, something hit them in the chest, uh, they have contusions on their chest and chest wall. You put them on the monitor, they show STEMI. Well, were they having chest pain before the trauma or did the trauma or the pain start after the trauma? If the pain started after the trauma, it is more likely a contusion. It's not says that they can't have a STEMI and trauma, but generally speaking, if um, it's unlikely they had both. So go with the more likely. It's probably the trauma. And if it is trauma, don't give them aspirin. Don't give them nitro. Do not treat it like it's a STEMI. You're treat it is a trauma patient. So here's some other abnormal findings, uh, reentries like um, SVTs, 
uh, PVCs, uh, PACs, various ectopic uh, beats, things along those lines. Uh, also, if there is a cardiac contusion or myocardial contusion, there's probably going to be a pulmonary contusion as well. Now, if you have a contusion on the left ventricle but not the right ventricle, then blood can back up into the lungs like a heart failure, just like if you had a left ventricular MI and you start getting that fluid in the lungs. What are you going to do? Drive fast. That's what you're going to do. Uh, these people are dead. You're probably not going to have anything survivable if they have a myocardial rupture, if the muscle of their uh, ventricles or atria is torn open. Now, when it's their septum or maybe the chordae tendine and you have like, it basically creates mitral valve regurge or something like that, kind of like a um, patient never had a heart murmur and all of a sudden after the trauma they do, those are, not, those are far more... Um, survivable but a rupture of the ventricles or the atria i mean like that's just um that's just gone um All right, so commodio cortis. So back in cardiology, we talked about the ability of a heart to be restarted with impact or how a, a sudden impact could cause the heart to go into a ventricular arrhythmia. It's called commodio cortis. We see this in trauma when you have a blunt force trauma to the chest that um, happens at the exact moment of the relative refractory period. Uh, in the T wave, so right at the end of the T wave, this is that R on T phenomena, but a sudden blunt force uh, impact can cause it as well. These are easily treated with defibrillation um, and CPR. This is probably one of the biggest reasons children's sports like baseball and football and such have to have a EMS crew on standby with AEDs present is that if there's that tra uh, strike in the chest and then um, result in cardiac arrest, it's quickly recovered from with the AED. So basically they're in cardiac arrest, they dead. You just do CPR, you defibrillate them, problem solved. The tonic-clonic seizure by definition is not truly a tonic-clonic seizure. It, we, we might call it the V-fib seizure uh, or the cadaver reflex. It's basically the brain has gone into a seizure as due to a hypoxic state from the fall. This is why you may have seen it before. You run a call, dispatch to a seizure with a no seizure history, and you get there and the patient's in cardiac arrest. Well, they never had a seizure. They just had that V-fib seizure. They... Uh, quivered and stiffened when they uh, went into cardiac arrest. All right, so traumatic aortic di disruptions, traumatic um, and great vessel disruptions. This is when the aorta has um, been torn. The most common location for this to happen is the ligamentum arteriosum. Pull up a picture of that. Um, this is the little, you see it a lot in um, drawings of the heart as a little white line uh, between the pulmonary arteries and the aorta. Um, it is actually the leftovers of the ductus arteriosus. This is that pathway between the pulmonary artery in the aorta that is open in uh, utero during fetal development so that blood can bypass the lungs because it's not being oxygenated within the lungs. So here you can see uh, multiple pictures of it. Um, it's very, maybe hard for you to see it in this picture. Let's see here. You, I don't, that's a really crony picture. Um, here's a good one. So right there, you can see it. Um, the arrow is pointing to it. That's norm. That's the uh, patent or the ductus arteriosus during uh, fetal circulation. It then closes into this um, ligament once they do the fetal transition or neo, neonatal transition. 
when force is applied to the heart, you know, like a sudden deceleration force, like a T-bone accident or something like that, causing the heart to swing within the chest, it can actually swing and tear that uh, pulling the aorta and the pulmonary artery away from each other and tear open the aorta or the pulmonary artery, resulting in uh, massive blood loss in a very short period of time into the mediastinum. So no, rather unpleasant and uncomfortable uh, situation for the patient. Uh, they do not tend to survive very well. Um, oops, keep hitting the wrong button. All right, there we go. So come on. There we go. All right. So the other options are the typical um, aneurysms with the weakening of the tunica intima, blood filling the tunica media area, stretching it, stretching out the adventitia, and then eventually the adventitia rupturing and blood leaking everywhere. This can be from a uh, high blood pressure, you know, from the medical aneurysm standpoint, or uh, which set the stage for it. And then the trauma caused the rupture of the tunica adventitia, and they, you know, bleed out. In much the same way, um, patient is going to have a history of a sudden deceleration injury or blunt force trauma, uh, could have penetrating trauma as well, and they may have... Um, <clears throat> um, all, well, they'll have all the signs and symptoms of shock. Uh, the hematoma that they're talking about here with dysphagia, hoarseness, or strider, difficulty swallowing, this would be when the aortic arch is swelling up into a large aneurysm and hasn't fully ruptured, and that aneurysm is putting pressure on the trachea or on the esophagus, making it harder for them to uh, speak or swallow. Uh, t -t 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 -t. yeah, F MOI, you, those sudden deceleration injuries are really what you're going to look for, for these. Um, all right, um, yeah, fluids, but remember, this is internal bleeding. You can't stop it. So you're going to want to be cautious with your fluids. You're going to need to give fluids, but you're accepting a uh, more or less an acceptable hypo, uh, or hypotension. Very much the same issue when you're dealing with vena cava injuries, uh, pulmonary artery or vein injuries, your subclavian vein injuries. Um, yeah, much the same structure. This is where the vessel has been damaged either through blunt or in these cases, probably more likely penetrating trauma. Uh, this would indicate, this would be present in an extremity. Let's say the venous return from the arm or the leg has been damaged or reduced due to a uh, crushing or constriction on that are a vein and so the arteries pumping blood down in there but it can't get back out and so that extremity is swelling up with a compartment syndrome and then, but it also could involve like a rupture of the vena cava or subclavian veins or something that's causing massive internal bleeding So diaphragmatic injuries, we'll talk about them a little bit more in our abdominal trauma chapter, but it is covered in the chest trauma chapter because when the diaphragm ruptures, the abdominal contents enters the chest cavity and you can have things like bowel sounds in the chest cavity. It would be important to remember that the liver is on the right side. Therefore, most of your ruptures of the diaphragm are gonna be on the left side where the stomach is and you don't have that large solid organ to protect the diaphragm. All right, so could it become big enough to cause a tension pneumo? Yes. Of course, it's not tension pneumo. It's tension gastrothorax, where the abdominal contents have entered the chest wall enough, or the chest cavity, enough to um, reduce lung volume. So here's a good example of that, where you can see the stomach and part of the intestines has entered that um, pleural space. <clears throat> 
this is a surgical emergency. This is not something that we can be particularly uh, bene benefit in the field. So early recognition or suspicion of it and rapid transport to a trauma center. So esophageal and tracheal injuries. So these are generally gonna be from penetrating trauma. Very rarely are they going to come with a um, blunt force trauma of any type because there's just not a little, they're well protected by the spine and there's not a lot of pulling or tearing it happens to them. Pleuritic chest pain is that burning pain every time they take a breath or something in their chest. It can lead to a chemical peritonitis or um, pleuritis because of the uh, stomach acids and blood being lost into the mediastinum. Uh, the subcutaneous emphysema is going to be more commonly associated with the trachea, not as much with the esophagus. This is an example of tracheal injury. This is where you're going to end up with something like a uh, medial, uh, pneumomediastinum, where their, that middle section where their heart is is filling with air. It's not the pleural space, um, but it could also involve a pneumothorax in the pleural space. Even if you intubate this patient, it is highly unlikely that you'll be able to avoid the medius, the ruptured trachea or bronchial, and they will likely have very poor outcomes due to that inability to oxygenate that lung. If you were lucky, <coughs> excuse me, and right main stemmed your ET tube and it was a left bronchial injury, which would be a little difficult to identify for certain, although a hyper resonance and diminished lung sounds on the left would indicate would be an indicator you might be able to get keep the patient alive but this is assuming that the patient had a left-sided injury and you right main stemmed if they're right main stem and you put excuse me if they're a right side injury even if you were to right main stem the et tube you're probably just simply going to cause the injury to be worse I mentioned the trach the hoarseness and all that earlier. This is because of contusions and swelling within the airway um, causing that hoarseness and difficulty breathing. Any high ventilatory pressures, so the jet insufflation, you know, the little um, ventilators that are pressure run and things like that. Um, these are all going to complicate things significantly for the patient because <clears throat> They are, um, they're only going to make these bronchial ruptures, tracheal bronchial injuries uh, leak quicker. So traumatic asphyxiation. This is when a patient has had a compression on their chest that was significant enough to prevent them from inhaling. So an example of this would be a pedestrian run over by a car and pinned between the ground and the car. They have the car sitting on their chest or the uh, mechanic who doesn't know how to use jack stands who raises the car up with a jack and then the jack fails and the vehicle falls on their chest. Another example would be a person who's been buried in like a trench collapse and the dirt compresses in on them. Every time they take a breath, instead of air coming into their lungs, dirt compresses their chest a little bit more and they have less and less lung volume. These are all options associated with traumatic asphyxiation. Uh, what this does is there's really nothing structurally wrong with the patient. There's not necessarily injury. It's just they can't get air in their lungs. So positive pressure ventilation can be helpful in oxygen uh, delivery can be beneficial in this. But if the pressure becomes high enough, as you can see here, it starts backing up the blood, increasing pressure in their chest or in their um vasculature of their head and face and you can get the blown pupils this is why you see a lot of the cape cyanosis and then cape uh hemorrhaging here where you have the basically from the nipple line up they're purple uh very similar to the patient who has the pulmonary embolism and dies as a result of that the blood has been trapped in that upper portion of their circulatory system and uh, results in a backing up of that blood <clears throat> also the hypoxia there most of the time if you can relieve the pressure and restore ventilation as long as there hasn't been massive vascular vascular damage you're going to be successful in their uh, resuscitation 
significant vascular damage, you've lost too much blood. But the goal here is early oxygen administration and positive pressure ventilation. Obviously, removing the pressure or the asphyxiation, you know, the, the weight would be ideal, but sometimes we have to wait due to technical rescue delays and things like that. Yeah, there you go. All right, so that wraps chest trauma. Next week, we have class on Friday, and that is Friday the 8th, I think it is. Yeah, Friday the 8th. We will meet for class as normal. We will have a quiz first thing in the morning covering all of um, the, what's the word? What am I talking about? Covering the head, neck, and spine. Um trauma as well as chest trauma so chapter 34 and 35 will be the quiz next week those will be our that's what the quiz will cover um let me know if you need anything call it a day